How can you avoid being sexually harassed? How can you avoid being accused of being a harasser? I'm Dan Ringer, and we'll talk about sexual harassment right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. If you follow the news, you know that sexual harassment is a real and difficult problem for the alleged victim, for the alleged harasser, and for employers. My guest is attorney David Morrison. David, welcome back to The Law Works. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. The reason I asked you to come is because you do a great deal of work related to employment law. Yes. And if uh, you follow the news, the phrase sexual harassment seems to come up every day with regard to one situation or another and sometimes it's just mind-numbing the things that have happened and people are saying well I didn't know there was anything wrong with that what is sexual harassment harassment sexual harassment is offensive conduct to the person allegedly harassed offensive conduct that is so pervasive or severe that it creates a hostile work environment, at least in the employment law context. That's the definition. But it's offensive to the person who is the target of the behavior. That's correct. Because what, and that's what makes it difficult in part, because what is offensive to one person may not be offensive to the next, but it has to be based upon uh, gender or sex for it to be sexual harassment. Well, not always gender, though, is it? Well, it's, it, it is always gender, it, but uh, if you're asking if a man can harass another man, the answer is yes, uh, illegally, uh, or a woman could harass a woman, the answer is yes, because uh, as long as it's based on gender, and there, there's a distinction between sexual harassment involving man on man or woman on woman and, and the locker room conduct. Um, locker room conduct often, especially uh, for men, uh, or boys in, in high school uh, is not sexual harassment because they're just carrying on. It's not really based on gender, but it's and that's a distinction you have to draw in these cases. I, I want to pick on you for, for saying that because just carrying on and sexual harassment seem oftentimes to be the same thing. It, and it's very difficult. It, it's in the eyes of the beholder at the time, and that's what makes these cases so difficult. And, and often we defend because I primarily defend these cases, I defend cases on the basis that it wasn't unwelcome conduct, it has to be unwelcome and offensive in order to be sexual harassment. So regardless of our genders, if you say or do something directed at me, I have some obligation to let you know that I don't want you to do that? You should, and that's what we normally recommend. Most people don't want to be offensive, so if you tell them that what they're doing is offensive, they'll usually stop it. And so, well, that's what we recommend initially to try to get to stop is just tell the person to knock it off. I, I think because he's been in the news a lot relatively recently, the former mayor of San Diego, and I listened to the things he did to the women. It seemed like every woman he came in contact with, he, they would, he would see them, pictures of them, or he, they would be interviewed on TV, and there was no uniform. The only, well, the only thing they had in common was they were women. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, did he realize what he was doing or was he just mind-numbingly inappropriate? 
I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I've read the newspaper articles about that, and I know he went into some sort of a rehab program. Um, For a short period. It, it, it would be, amaze me if he didn't know better. I mean, in today's world, you really ought to uh, behave yourself. Uh, I use the rule of thumb that if it's not something that you want your mother to see, but perhaps you shouldn't do it or say it. And uh, that's a good rule of thumb to have in the workplace. Stephen Colbert, uh, came out with his rules for avoiding being accused of sexual harassment and he said it was the don't rules. The D stood for don't and all the other letters were irrelevant. <laughs> Just don't do it. <laughs> and that pretty well sums it up. If somebody understands what it is, and I, w I will admit uh, that I have been in situations uh, in offices where somebody would come up and say, you know, you said thus and so or you talked about such and so somebody else in the office took took exception to that and I would go to the other person usually it was colorful language or something that right. I picked up in the service or something like that and I'd go and I'd apologize and, and say if, if you hear me do that again tell me about it I don't mean to do that and that was fine that worked out very well I don't know how often that kind of behavior that reaction to that kind of behavior occurs though because that seems so well reasoned. It, well, it is well reasoned. Some people are afraid of confrontation, so they won't say what you just said. And that is just go up to the person and say, you know, that bothers me, would you not do it? Or I apologize, I won't say that again if it does bother you. Folks are afraid of confrontation uh, and they avoid it generally and they just will not make those, those comments. Uh, let me say too that, that sexual harassment, one, one dirty joke in the workplace is not sexual harassment, and that doesn't give everybody in West Virginia the right to go out and tell a dirty joke tomorrow. But one dirty joke is usually not enough. It has to be so severe and pervasive to change the working atmosphere, to make it a hostile place to work. That's what the definition is. When, when does it become hostile? How do I have to feel about going to work for it to be a hospital or a hostile environment? Well, generally, uh, it has to be you have to have, a, it becomes a difficult place to work because of the environment. You can't focus on your job, you can't concentrate on your job because of the distractions caused by the, the hostile environment uh, due to sexual comments or statements or placards or anything else that could be sexual in nature. What kind of conduct constitutes sexual harassment? Is it the pat on the fanny kind of conduct or is it less than that or more than that? Um, Usually, well, it has to be severe. Uh, a touching is considered more severe than verbal uh, statements or things posted on a wall like the old calendars you used to see in, uh, many years ago with the Rigid Tool Company. Uh, that was the one that came to my mind. Yeah, uh, they were all over the place. They, uh, so it has to be more, if it's a touching, there's, it becomes more severe than if there's not a touching. It's all in gradation. You have to look and it, look at everything that's happened and look at the surrounding circumstances and determine whether or not it was really unwelcome or uh, so severe that it altered the work atmosphere. There are, there are situations where people uh, carry on with each other all the time and then somebody gets mad and it becomes sexual harassment down the road. And that can be a problem. Uh, with some of the touching that, that goes on in the workplace. Well, it can also be a problem with the kind of language or the jokes that are told no around question. the workplace. Uh, I have seen situations, usually it was a woman working in a predominantly male environment, that's just the way it is, or the way it seemed to me, uh, who would be a long time suffering employee who would just sit there and take it, not say anything about it until finally something happened. Does the fact that she didn't complain for a long period of time and then all of a sudden made a complaint, does that have any bearing on the validity of the complaint? It can uh, if the employer has a policy that uh, provides for an internal investigation and she had access to that policy and she never used it or waited a long time to use it, then I can argue that perhaps it wasn't unwelcome if I'm defending the, def the employer. But at the same time, often, uh, you, you, the people want to avoid confrontation. They just want to get along and they take it and they take it and they take it because they feel like they have to in order to remain employed. And it doesn't become welcome just because you have to go through that scenario. We're talking about sexual harassment. My guest is attorney David Morrison. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. 
in contracts, we very often, as lawyers, include a, a phrase to the effect of just because I didn't complain about a breach of the contract every time doesn't mean that I can't complain about it the next time. Right. Is that sort of the same thing that we're talking it about? It is, sure. If it's unwelcome, it's still unwelcome. And generally, uh, those people can explain why they didn't complain earlier. And so the best thing for employers to do is to enforce their policies, make sure that, uh, that folks understand that they cannot participate in that sort of conduct at work. It's not acceptable. And then uh, you can avoid lawsuits and other problems. But you come to me and say, Dan, cut it out. You're telling dirty jokes or you're making suggestive comments or you're putting your arm around whomever. Cut it out. You're not allowed to do that. And my response is, don't I have a constitutional right to free speech, to associate with whom I want to, to say what I want? You know, we've been down that road. Uh, we often see the free speech argument being made. Uh, sure, everyone has a right of freedom of expression. That's what the First Amendment guarantees. But there's a limit on that. Uh, I can't walk into a crowded theater and scream fire uh, and, and because I have a constitutional right to speak. That creates a dangerous situation. Similarly, one is not permitted to engage in sexual harassment or racial harassment or any of the other illegal types of harassments uh, because uh, it, it, the First Amendment simply does not protect that type of conduct. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, if you're a long-suffering employee, do you have an obligation to say, okay, I've put up with it to this point, but I'm just not going to put up with it anymore? Um, I will tell you how the courts have dealt with that, and, I, and the answer to the question is, I think so. Um, the United States Supreme Court back, gosh, in the early, mid-1980s, uh, and then again as recently as the early 2000s, uh, has indicated that they really, the courts really want the employer to deal with harassment issues. They don't want every harassment issue to end up in the courtroom. So the EEOC, which is Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, a federal government agency, uh, and the courts are requiring or suggesting very strongly that employers have policies that include a complaint procedure uh, that anyone can use and the employer once a complaint is filed, the employer must do an, uh, a, a thorough and prompt investigation. There can be no retaliation against the person complaining or anybody participating in the investigation. And then if something is found to be to have happened, something that could be deemed sexual harassment has happened, then the employer has to take what is known as prompt remedial action or effective remedial action. And that is action to make it stop. It could be discipline such as discharge, it could be a transfer, it could be lots of different things depending upon the circumstances, but the employer must take some action at that point. If the employer does not, then clearly that employee is going to have uh, a lawsuit to pursue. Uh, does it matter how big the company is? Should not, no. Now, there are a lot of federal laws that only apply to employers that have 50 employees, sometimes 50 employees at that location or something like that. Well, the um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination. That's why it's illegal. And it arises under the federal law, Title VII of, 19, uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It also uh, is prohibited, harassment is prohibited under our State Human Rights Act. Um, you have to have 15 employees for the State Human Rights Act to apply. But there's a common law right as well, so it really, and by common law I mean the courts have said even if you don't have 15 employees, you still have the right not to be harassed in the workplace and you can still bring a lawsuit to prohibit it. Well, what if it's not the workplace? We talked about the mayor, former mayor of San Diego. He was apparently harassing, the phrase would be anything wearing a skirt, any female that he came in contact with, most of whom were not employees of the city of San Diego. They were just people he met, Navy admirals for heaven's sakes, among others. They have a right to complain too? It depends upon the circumstances. The, uh, that would have, in that situation, California law would apply, so I'm really not sure. But in West Virginia, for example, if, uh, 
if I have uh, a, a business and a vendor comes on the premises and our vin that vendor harasses one of my employees, then I have an obligation to try to make that stop. Uh, so, or a customer comes into a restaurant that uh, we own and that customer harasses a waitress. We have an obligation to take action to make that stop. And, and there are various things we can do depending upon the circumstances. Uh, but the Human Rights Act applies to places of public accommodation such as um, housing and so on. And it also applies to the, um, to the workplace. So primarily, uh, my obligation as an employer is to prevent my employees from being harassed. I really can't generally go outside of that employment relationship, but if it happens at work, then I have an obligation to try to stop it. So if the waitress harasses the customer in the restaurant, you have to stop the waitress from doing that? Yes. What if the customer harasses the waitress? And we have the, the equal responsibility to stop it. You just tell that customer to be gone and never darken your doorstep again. That's usually what happens. Um, and I've had situations where uh, delivery people have come onto uh, the premises of employers I represent and then they harass the clerk or someone who is there taking the delivery. Uh, and we've had to have the vendor stop bringing or sending that person to our premises. And I've, I've participated in helping accomplish that for employers. It seems like it would be easy for someone to make up a claim of sexual harassment. It is. Not founded in fact. Just say, he made a pass at me repeatedly. Just one pass at you, I suppose, doesn't make any difference, but repeated, 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 or suggestive comments uh, would. But it never really happened. And that's very difficult because you often, when employers do these investig investigations, and I do a number of them for employers, they'll just ask me to do it for them, we often get he said, she said situations where she said he did it, he said he didn't do it, and there are no other witnesses. So what do you do? Well, I, I'm not God. I can't tell who's telling the truth and who isn't. So what I do uh, then is try to see if we can find a way to separate them. I don't know who's telling the truth. I mean, she might have some vendetta against him who knows? So I have to try to uh, find a way to try to separate them or deal with the issue at the time. Uh, but I try to get them apart if I can. We're talking about sexual harassment. My guest is attorney David Morrison. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. It seems as though in that kind of situation where there is no objective proof that you, you the employer, you, the investigator, just can't win. Somebody is going to be extraordinarily angry at you when all is said and done. It's very difficult, and I've seen cases where uh, employers assume that the person claiming harassment is telling the truth, and that the person denying harassment is not telling the truth, and then they, the employer fires the guy who supposedly harassed. Maybe he didn't harass. That person then brings a lawsuit uh, for wrongful discharge because he was discharged and hadn't done anything wrong. So you, it can come at you both ways as an employer and that's why your investigation has to be so good uh, and you just, you've got to, you, you have to do a thorough investigation, interview everybody who might have knowledge of what happened so that you can reach some sort of conclusion. Suppose two employees in the same workplace start dating. Is there a problem with that? It often turns into a problem. Um, that happens all the time, as you know. Uh, people meet and, and start dating. Um, in fact, statistics indicate that most people marry people that they met in school or at work. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very common. Um, it, it can be a problem if the, the relationship sours and then one wants to continue the relationship. At that point, it becomes sexual harassment. Um, and I've seen that situation. So we normally tell, uh, I say we, when I give advice to employers, I tell employers, uh, you can't really prevent people from dating usually. I mean, that's their private lives, but they need to understand the problems that can be created if they do. Then you get into the situation as well where uh, let's assume that uh, a woman is having a relationship with a man, he is her supervisor, the, uh, she gets a good performance evaluation, she gets a raise that others don't get, then the others might have a complaint that you have to 
on the basis you have to sleep with the boss in order to uh, get a job benefit. So it, it, it could come at you again from various ways and you have to deal with each situation as it arises. And those can be very difficult because the supervisor may be attracted to the employee for a variety of reasons, but one reason may be that the employee is really competent and really a, a good worker and that tends to lead to promotions and salary increases and even getting married. Right. You like the person better. You like their personality, you like how they work, etc. So it can be difficult. What about policies that say if your married couples can't work in the same workplace? There are policies that say that uh, and I believe those policies are perfectly legal. Uh, I had a situation once involving a, a relationship between a supervisor and a subordinate. Uh, we, that employer did not permit that sort of relationship between a supervisor and subordinate. If they didn't work together, it had been a different issue, but because of the other problems that can be created, uh, they, they wouldn't permit those folks to date. Uh, the employer went to those two and said, uh, you have a choice to make. You can, uh, either one of you can quit or both of you can quit, but uh, we can't have this relationship in the, in this office. The office is too small and they both said they were not going to quit and so the employer fired them both um, and they enforced the, the employer forced enforced the policy there was no sex discrimination because the man and woman were both treated the same uh, but they wanted to enforce that policy to, to prevent the uh, other employees from complaining about the favoritism and so on I have uh, had occasions where I would recommend to an employer if you usually the employers say, "I want to keep both employees. They're good employees. I, I'm, I'm satisfied with them. I want to keep them." I usually say, "Well, then define some kind of policy or procedure by which neither one reports directly to the other." And that's the best advice, um, because if you can, uh, if that can be arranged, the problem with the scenario I described was it couldn't be arranged because it was a small office. There were only four or five people that worked in the office and he's the one that ran it. So if she was going to work there, she had to report to him. And one of the problems uh, typically in West Virginia is that most of the laws in uh, defining the workplace talks about small businesses and large businesses, and small businesses are, are businesses who have 50 or fewer employer, employees. And in West Virginia, most by far businesses have 50 or fewer employees, so we're all small businesses, and it's sometimes tricky to decide which laws apply to you. Okay, there's sexual harassment going on in the workplace. Uh, employee A is harassing employee B, and the employer is trying to figure out what to do about this. Employee B says, I'm going to sue. Who gets sued? Uh, employee B can sue both the individual harasser, alleged harasser, and also the employer. Um, if there's a different standard of liability depending upon whether the alleged harasser is a supervisor or a, just a co-employee. So it doesn't have to be a supervisor subordinate relationship? No, 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 no. And I've been involved in a number of cases where the co-employee, in fact I'm involved in one right now, where a co-employee uh, was sued along with the, with the company. And then the company has to decide uh, is the company going to defend that, that person? Because if the person did engage in harassment, it may have been outside, it probably was outside of the company's policies, but outside the scope of employment because the scope of employment does not include harassment. So the employer may not defend, may not hire a law firm to defend that guy, and he may have to go out and find his own lawyer. So it can be very, very expensive. Or in the interest of fairness, she may have to go out and find her own lawyer. <laughs> yeah, and I should say that it's, it, it goes both ways, uh, certainly. Well, it, if there is a verdict returned, is it returned against the employer and against the employee or against both of them together? Or? It can be against both of them. It can, no, it would be individual verdicts. It would be a verdict against the employee and a verdict against the employer. Or the employer could get a defense verdict and the employee could be held liable individually uh, without the employer being held liable. That can happen. How long does it take to resolve one of these lawsuits? Oh, well, uh, it depends upon the county you're in, but in, in certain counties in West Virginia, the case could go on for three, four years. Then you have the appellate process. If somebody loses, you appeal to the West Virginia State Supreme Court. They have it for a year by the time you have your filings and they respond. So it could be a five or six year proposition. So if you want to complain, 
complain, try to resolve it, but it may not be quick and it may not be cheap. That's right. If you want to take it into court, uh, that's exactly right. If, um, but the best way to resolve it, if you can, is through the internal process. Most people don't really want to sue. They want to work, and they want to work without being harassed, and they have the right to do that, and it's, it's good for morale for everybody. David Morrison, thank you very much, Dave, for coming in. Thanks. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of The Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. On The Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Additional support for the Law Works is provided by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.